Hey guys, I hope to wrap up the TV portion of this set. I keep forgetting that we've got a radio to restore that also goes with this. And right now I am working on putting on the last final touches on the power supply, I hope. If you recall, I place both the can dome with these aluminum arc hole type resistors. And I uh, wanted to make sure I had a heat, heat sink compound on there and I insulated... Uh, connections with some heat shrink tubing and I got a comment about um, someone who didn't necessarily trust the insulation between the resistor contact and the, and the housing well it never even occurred to me to actually look that up and what I did um, wasn't so easy to find um, they, I found the spec sheets kind of confusing so they give two voltage ratings, I believe. One, it, it turns out once I realized the formula they were using is the, is the voltage across it, which translates into the power formula of how much voltage and current and how much power this can handle. So it had nothing to do with the breakdown between this lug and the body. It seems to be, well, it depends on the model. The larger ones have more of a breakdown voltage than the lower ones. It seems like it's some, uh, somewhere on the order of a kilovolt, as near as I could make out, so I think we're okay. And I searched all over various forums and whatnot, and it never, it never came up. Um, I was just Googling things like, what is the voltage breakdown on a aluminum housed chassis mount resistor between a lug and the chassis? How much voltage can you put on this? So there's a lug coming in here. And then one coming out, and the resistive element inside, and then it's potted in what appears to be epoxy, and then it's inside of an aluminum housing. Well, you put in a voltage on one of these lugs, it's going to arc over to the body, or to the chassis. But, I, I think we're fine. I, I mean, I've used these before, it's never been an issue. The spec sheet, they didn't, as I recall, they didn't give it in DC, they only gave it in AC. And it was on the order of one kilovolt or more AC, so I think we're okay, because we got well below that. So, last order of business is this filter choke. Before it was measuring 1.5K, it should be about 150 ohms. It has measured it again, and it's about 10K, so this filter choke is open, or nearly so. Um, so what am I going to do about it? Um, for now, I'm going to replace it with a resistor. A power resistor, and so here's the existing cap that was there. And the way it was set up was, well, here, let's look at the schematic here. I'll show you how. It was really simple. So, rectifier, capacitor, filter choke, and then off to the chassis. And that's it. And then on the main chassis, if you follow it around, I think there was another filter kit. Yeah, 40 microfarad in the main chassis. So, filter chokes do a pretty decent job of filtering out ripple, as do the caps. And in conjunction, they work pretty well. I'll uh, replace this with a resistor. They don't do as good a job, but I can compensate by beefing up the cap. I'm not going to mess with this guy. The 40, it's already installed, and I don't want to take that out. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to attack in another one here. And for the resistance, I'm going with a 390 ohm 3 watt resistor. Previously, I had that in parallel with this. Um, Filter choke. I'm going to take the filter choke completely out and uh, secure this 390 a bit better. Then add another filter cap down here and um, then double check when I get this set all back powered up to the voltage. I think it's supposed to be 160 volts. So, Speaking of voltage, another thing that came up was with the replacement with control I'm using the voltages, voltage pulses I'm getting to the plate are about 300 volts. So I got to look and to see oh, how much voltage can a 6AU6 take on the plate. It can take like 325. And then somebody commented, well, the suppressor grid 
is going down to the boost voltage, which is kind of high, and it got me thinking, that's kind of pushing or exceeding the, the specs on a 6AU6. And then I paid attention, well, what's the cathode going to? Because these voltages on the plate and screen are with regards to the cathode, not the ground. The cathode on this is not grounded. The cathode on this is going to low B+. Plus. So the cathode's got about 150, 160 volts on it. So that 300 volt pulse I measured was the ground. So it's actually only a 150 volt pulse. So whoa, within the design guide, uh, guidelines. Same with the uh, screen voltage. So I think we're fine there. I may still tinker a little bit with uh, putting a voltage divider on that. But um, now that I realize the cathode is, is well above ground, uh, I think we're just fine and dandy with all that stuff. I finished work on the main TV chassis that basically involved replacing a few parts up here in the audio section, including the 4 microfarad electrolytic, replaced by this axial guy there. And I secured the new horizontal um, ringing coil more securely. I snapped it into the chassis and soldered down the tab like the original had been. This one actually works out better because in the original the lugs are located like this and this one are this way so the leads uh, fit better on it. So, a line of time. Um, before we get into it I got a few thoughts. Number one, I appreciate all the enthusiasm whenever I bring up doing a TV alignment. However, I don't want to dampen your spirits, but I have shown TV alignments before. And on this or a very similar chassis before. And I question how much value you're going to get out of it. Because people have been disappointed in the past because it raised more questions and confusion than it addressed. And my general response when somebody asks me about aligning a TV is I say get the service info and just do what it says. Because there is no magic way to do it for every TV. General concepts, yes, but it's a very specific procedure for each model, each brand, each design about how you go through it. I'll give you some simple examples. Some early TVs like this have a split carrier. Right after the tuner, there are two wires that come out. One goes to the video IF, one goes to the audio IF. Most TVs, pretty much every TV after 1950-51 use intercarrier sound and video. If there's one common IF for sound and video, then there's a 4.5 megahertz tap for the audio. In this, separate IF. Separate gain for video and for sound. And the sound IF is 21.25 megahertz. Which is another big difference is every TV made after uh, 53, 54, 55, somewhere in there used a 44 megahertz IF. Earlier sets used a 21 or 22 megahertz IF. Okay, that's just the difference in frequency. Okay. And then there is the matter of the IF amplifier itself and the design. It's not like an AM radio. You don't want to peak it to get just a sharp response. For example, in this set, this is the response you want. And really the idealized response would be this would be completely flat. And this would be very sharp. And this actually is supposed to be tapered. And that has to do with the NTSC broadcast standard and the fact that it's... Uh, they kind of fudge the sideband a little bit to make it easier for the designers. Yeah. Well, I don't want to get into that too deep, but... <laughs> sharp on one side, bit of a gradual decline on the other and basically flat on top. Why isn't this flat on top? Because that's really really hard to do because this is really wide. This is like four megahertz wide. That's really wide bandwidth. So 
how do you do that? Well, this set uses a stagger tuned IF, which is a pretty nice way to go. And what that means is each stage, each coil, is tweaked to a peak to a different frequency. For example, 23.5, 25.3, 22. So you got a bunch of stages that are peaked at different frequencies, and when you sum all that together, you get something like this, which approximates a plateau. And yes, this is upside down because depending on the test equipment you use, the response <laughs> goes this way. Or you can simply flip it on your scope so it goes the other way. But quite often in service info you see it going down. Now there's another way to do it, which is to use overcoupled IF transformers where you actually dampen them out by putting a resistor across the primary and the secondaries to kind of decrease the peak. You don't want a sharp peak, so putting a resistor across the coils spreads out the response. Makes it kind of a, well, a lousy, <laughs> a lousy peak. It would be terrible for an AM radio, but for this kind of thing it's good. Anyways, my point with all that is it's not like an AM radio. It's not like an FM radio. Alright, so all that being said, the instructions that you're going to see for this are specific to this chassis. And the equipment I'm going to show is specific to my equipment. So unless you're aligning an Admiral 20B1 or maybe a 20A1 chassis and have the same equipment I do, I think it's going to be of rather limited value to you. So I'm going to, like I've done before, explain the basic setups, but I'm going to kind of blow through it pretty quick. Uh, so, another point. These instructions are not for doing a visual alignment. Back then, most service techs did not have sweep generators and fancy scopes and stuff like that. But anybody, any tech back then is going to have an RF generator and is going to have a VTVM. So that is really all you need to go through and do all this stuff. Notice there are no pretty pictures. Later service info, they generally show more and more pictures about how, what the response curve should look like. This, they just kind of throw it in at the bottom and say the overall response should look something like this, but they don't even show you what the markers are for these peaks. <laughs> so they're basically assuming that very few service techs are going to have equipment to do a visual alignment. So really all you need to do this is an RF generator and a VTVM. In a pinch you could use a DMM. It's a little bit trickier. Or you could use a scope. I'll briefly go through these steps, but again, they're very, very specific to this particular chassis. But some of the general concepts are common. So, for example, the very first thing says to attach a battery to the AGC bus. Now, a number of you commented, what the heck is this Duracell battery doing hanging in the TV? That's a common procedure, is to attach a battery to the AGC bus. AGC is short for Automatic Gain Control also known as AVC, Automatic Volume Control and Radio, same concept. It's the set varying the gain of the front end and IF stages as the incoming signal level varies. So you get a constant level output of the amplifier. Now when you're adjusting the amplifiers, you don't want the set fighting you by tweaking the bias points on the tubes and adjusting the gain. So you pin it down in this case, they use say ne use negative four and a half volts. A battery is just a really convenient way to do it. You could use a DC power supply. Just make sure it's floating and don't connect it to the wrong point because you could fry it if you attached it to B plus or something like that. So battery is a pretty safe way to go. Allow the set to warm up. Disconnect any antenna. Set the channel selector to an unused channel. They're pretty much all unused now, so that's not really an issue. And the rest of the stuff is very specific to this chassis. That you got to attach a resistor and a capacitor, and that's where you hook up your, v, your, your VTVM or scope and so on. I'm not going to even go into that. And then the general idea is you inject 
these fixed RF frequencies unmodulated and you do what it says adjust this coil, adjust these coils adjust and so on, either, peak, either going for a maximum or a minimum so you notice there's 21.25 repeated over and over that's for the sound so some of the coils are for trapping it because you don't want the sound bleeding into the video and then there's also you also do want to pick it off from and, and amplify it. So some of the coils are peaked for 21.25 maximum, and then some are for a minimum to separate the signal out. And the rest of these are for the stagger tune. So that's why you get 25.3, 23.5, 22, 22.3. Uh, that is what will ideally end up giving you this response. Only a real thing of interest here, I think, is how do you inject the signal? You don't go through the antenna terminal. Because we're bypassing the RF uh, local oscillator and mixer. So, what you actually do, I believe it's this, it's this guy, you lift the shield up a little bit. I usually wrap the bottom in electrical tape. And you clip the high side of your RF, RF generator to the sh tube shield and put the negative to the chassis. So you capacitively couple your RF signal via the shield inside and into the inner tube elements and it'll go into the TVIF. You could also clip it in here. This is the output of the tuner. You could clip it here, but this is generally how they tell you to do it. Because you want a really low level signal, you want to make sure it's isolated, so you just go through the tube shield. And that's really all there is to it, to do the meter version of it anyways. Inject these RF frequencies through the tube shield, do what it says. Inject this frequency, adjust these coils either for a minimum or a maximum deflection on the VTVM. That's about it. To see this pattern, that's a whole other ball game. Then you need a swept RF generator and a scope or a specialized display. We'll talk about that later. Same with the ratio detector. This is exactly like an FM radio, which would be a 10.7 megahertz. Instead, this is a 21.25, but same concept. Just about ready to start the alignment. I've got my minus 4.5 volt bias pack installed, decoupling network on the video IF uh, detector. I'm going to try using a scope of the VTVM just because I've got it out and it's ready to go and the VTVM probe is kind of big and clunky and doesn't have a clip on the end of it. And I'm going to use uh, Hewlett Packard 8657A for my RF generator. And this is how I'm going to inject the signal. So I got an adapter on the output of that to BNC going to clip leads with a 47 ohm terminator. And I insulated the tube shield, and that's going to slide over the 6J6 mixer oscillator tube and I will clip this to ground and that's about it. The decoupling network what's that? Again, extremely specific to this TV I'm trying to gloss over the details, it's going to be different for every TV but that's how they say to hook it up so that's what I'm doing. In order to make sure my setup is working properly, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, to actually to step four. Because the first few steps are about adjusting the audio trap. So I'm jumping down to the, actually doing the video IF. So we're going to inject a signal at 25.3 megahertz. And we want to have an RF level in so we get about minus one volt out of the detector. And we're going to adjust A6 for a maximum. All of these coils are referred to as A something, A1 through A2, A3, A4, and so on. They give you a chart over here that shows you where those are, so I know that A6 is right there. Got this on 25.3. Now an interesting thing you can do with this to make sure that the signal is getting in, is if I turn on AM modulation, we should see something on the screen. 
So, I'll do that right there. And hey, we got lines. And hey, we've got stuff out of the video detector. So that's cool. Turn it off. And so, the way I'm going to try doing this with my scope here. Here, so you guys can see everything. All right. So we want to get minus one volt out. So I want to make sure my scope has got DC coupling. And get my reference ground on there. And set my output level. Turn on voltage measurement. So not much. I can increase the amplitude of the carrier. One the confusing thing about this is they talk about adjusting it for a maximum. Well, it's a negative voltage, so I believe what they mean is a maximum negative voltage, not positive. So basically as I adjust this coil, that line should go up and down. I've got twiddle sticks. All the coils have threaded brass shafts with slots in the end. And when I adjust A6, yep, the line moves up and down. Excellent. So I'm going to watch that line moving up and down rather than a needle swing back and forth on a VTVM. Well, one thing I can do with this scope is invert it so it'll make things a little more normal. So now negative is actually up, but I think it'll make more sense. So it's 500 volts per division, so I'm putting in much too strong a signal, so I'm going to knock that down. Ah, there we go. Just about one volt. And now I'm going to adjust that coil, see if we can get a maximum reading. Cool. That also work. I'll try decreasing the time base a little. Fortunately, unlike an analog scope where you get a nice dot moving across, digital scope's not quite going to work like that. But I think this will serve well enough for peaking. Maybe I'll increase the time base a little. So, yeah, it was pretty much on, dead on where it was. And since I'm already in the mode of doing the video, I have to do things a little bit out of order and finish going through the rest of the video IF stages. So that was 25.3. And uh, I'll do 23.5. Five megahertz. And now a seven. Again, I don't think these are going to be very far off because we have a pretty good picture. What well, doesn't hurt to go through the process. It's the sound that I'm really interested in doing. Alright, here's A7. Whoa, that one was way off. So much so, i got to double check and make sure i got the right coil there. 
so 23.5 a7 and a7 is the one between the 6al5 and the last 6au6 So where am I at? Huh. That's really surprising. Well, huh. How about that. I'm gonna decrease my amplitude a little bit. I didn't touch that one while working on this, so. Swapping tubes can affect the alignment a little bit. But I wouldn't expect it to be that much. Alright, finally, there's the peak. about there. Well, now I am curious to see how this <laughs> set is going to look when I'm done. Alright, I'm going to do, go through and do the rest of the video stages and then I'll pick up again when I'm uh, doing the audio. Alright, uh, the rest of the video and the audio trap so that you don't get audio into the video was dead on. Now I'm going through and doing step two, which is what I expect will be way off because of my changing the mic caps inside of the video, or sorry, audio IF cans. We're going to be injecting 21.25, that is the audio carrier, and we're going to be adjusting a 2, a 3, a 4 for maximum. Those are the cans that I opened up. And we're supposed to have about one and a half volts. So let's get this. And we're right there already. I haven't adjusted anything yet. I got minus 25 dBm going in. So let's get to it and do A2. Which is the top of the first can. So here we go. Now I did do these by ear, but I was off, not by much, but a little bit. Knock my input level down again a little bit. Amplitude minus six. Any of you who have aligned a radio, this is should be pretty familiar territory. Basically, as you peak the, each stage, you want to drop down the signal level you're injecting so you don't overload the amplifiers. You want to use as low an input signal level as you can while still getting a decent response out. Uh, a3 which is the bottom of the first can. There's only two coils on the bottom you got to adjust otherwise I would have this chassis flipped out and do them all from the top side but there are two down below you got to get at. Well, this one also wasn't too bad. Again, did it by ear. So, as you can see, yes, you can peak a radio, a TV audio by ear, but it's not going to be perfect unless you're really, really, really good, <laughs> superhumanly good. So I was close, but I was off a bit. And I know the ratio detector, the very last part, is definitely going to be off. And you cannot really align video by looking at the screen. You can maybe kind of sort of get it looking good, but uh, even with a really good test pattern, and I mean, I'm not saying you can't do it, but I don't think it's worth all the frustration. You're going to go through versus having uh, all the proper equipment and going through the proper procedures. All right, one left to do, A4, which is the bottom of the last coil. Amplitude. 
So I started out with an amplitude, I think, of minus 25 dBm. I'm now down to minus 31. So that's a pretty significant boost in the gain. About 6 dBs. dBms. Alright, so that's it. <laughs> it's really not that complicated. Not when you do, not when you do it this way versus visually. I mean, I'm basically done except for one final step. This is where a VTVM can come in handy. So, for those of you who have aligned FM radios, this is old hat. But the way FM works, it's frequency modulation. Our carrier is 21.25. So, as the audio is modulating this, it swings back and forth in frequency. We want to center the ratio detector coil so we get no output. 21.25 and as we swing to either side of that frequency we should get a positive or a negative swing on the scope so let's see if we can do that with this setup so I gotta move the scope connection made a few changes for doing the ratio detector to make it a little bit easier one, I put my scope in times one mode instead of times ten mode, so it's more sensitive. I'm down to 100 millivolt scale now. I turned on bandwidth limiting. That cleans up the trace a little bit. And uh, now I need to get that to be on zero. And if I turn the coil to either side, it should swing positive or negative. So well, that's going the wrong way. So, there we go, positive, negative. And we want this to be on zero. Cool. Alright, so now let's try doing a visual confirmation that the alignment is all correct. Alrighty. Visual alignment. Again, unless you've got this exact equipment is going to be a limited value to you and I suspect very few if any of you have this stuff um, but I'll go over it briefly this is the first time I've gotten to use this new toy by the way basically it's serving as a giant uh, oscilloscope in XY mode but this, this is a sweep RF generator it's hooked up just like the other one was RF out, go into that floating tube shield and then a scope probe go in to, well, it would be going to the DMOD in. I will hook it up in a moment, but first I want to explain what this thing does. This was originally designed for the cable TV industry. So it can sweep from one megahertz to a thousand megahertz. And if you put this in full sweep, it'll sweep that entire thing, a one gigahertz sweep. Way, 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 way more than what we want to do. Uh, the whole video bandwidth of this thing is only about, uh, four megahertz or so so we don't need to sweep any more than let's say 10 megahertz sweep well luckily we can go in delta f mode where we can set a center frequency and a sweep width our center frequency is gonna be let's say around 20 megahertz or so i'll have to play around with that a bit all right so what this does is it'll go it'll it's just like an RF generator, just like the one I was using, but imagine it has a knob. And at the lowest position, it is at the lowest frequency. And then you can rotate it, and as you rotate it, the frequency increases. So say we're going from 10 megahertz to 20 megahertz. Knob all the way left, 10 megahertz, rotate it, it's up to 20 megahertz, continuously. You know, nice smooth 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, up to 20 megahertz, and it snaps back to 10. And does it again and again and again that's all a sleep generator is it's just if you could put a motor with a cam on your frequency knob and it would just go nurch, 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 nurch. same thing exactly the same thing this sets the free the, the center frequency and this sets how wide so if I set this for say 20 
and I set the width for 10, it would go from 15 to 25. 15, 25, 15 to 25. That sets the output level. That's all this does on the top part. And then there's one, a couple little extra doodads down here, or a few extra doodads. One, the rate, the rate at which that knob internally is going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You can see it on the scope, or on this display, this is the slow mode. So imagine, now we're at the low, and then we're going high, back to low. Well, that's a little hard to follow, so you can go very fast, or faster. And then this is synchronized with the line, so 60 hertz, which is typically what I use. The slower, the more accurate. If you go too fast, it'll be sweeping back and forth so fast that the, it can affect the results. This recurring, which is what we're always going to use, if it was single, you can use an external trigger, and it would just, whatever time you get a trigger pulse, it would go from low to high, and then wait for the next trigger pulse. We'll keep it on recurring. Markers. That's what these little blips are. If we have no markers, we get a horizontal line. We don't know what anything is. Like at this point, we don't know what frequency this is. I kind of know it's starting at, say, 15 megahertz and ending at 25. Anywhere along here, I don't really know. It's kind of nice to have a guide guidepost. So this has some built-in ones. If you put it on 100, you get a ticket every 100 megahertz. Well, we're not sweeping anywhere near that much. How's that going to do us any good? 10, okay, put it on 10, we get a blip there. That is probably 20 megahertz. The last one does a tick every 1 megahertz. And notice the 20 is a little bit taller than the others. Well, what you can do with the controls here, so this is this is an XY display with some extra features like gain and whatnot. It's kind of meant, it's made by the same company, WaveTag. It's meant to, to go with this. So the vertical and horizontal output on this go right to the vertical and horizontal input on this. And it's got some positioning, some gain controls. What we can do is get this centered like so. And if I tweak the horizontal gain just right, we can get it so that those blips correspond to the grid on the screen. It's a little tricky, a little finicky. Once you get it, you can then guesstimate frequencies in, be, in between. So let's just pretend I got this perfect. And that's 20. That'd be 21, 22, 23, 24. Oh, sorry, I didn't have that set very well. So let's say that's be 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. And then we can guesstimate. Well, if that's 20 right in between, and that's 21, in between it'd be 20.5. If you get really close, you can kind of see where 20.1, 20.2, 20 20.3. 20 or, marker in. This also has an external marker in on the back. I could take my RF generator and hook that up to the marker input. And whatever I dialed into that, like 21.25 megahertz, it would put a blip at 21.25 megahertz. So, that is that. Let us see what all this does for us by actually hooking it up to the TV. So, take my scope probe and go to the DMOD in. Here's the overall response from my initial alignment attempt. And it's close, but not quite right. I remember the, their picture is inverted versus what I have. There is an inversion control on this. I uh, push this knob in, but I kind of like looking at it this way. So up is gain. And my frequency is higher on the right, and in their diagram the frequency is higher on the left. Go figure. Uh, but anyways, 
there should be this point here 25.75 should be the halfway point from the two peaks that's kind of there but the overall shapes a bit off so I'm just going to rock a couple of these coils Let's see if I can get things looking any better no, that's worse let's go the other way Remember, we're not looking for maximum gain. We're looking for a flat response with the right shape. So there, even though the gain is going down, the overall shape is what we want. Let's see if we can get that left side up a little bit. See, you might think, hey, we got more gain there. Yeah, but we want the gain to be wide and flat as possible because the video bandwidth is pretty wide. It's looking maybe okay, but let's see what's over here. So it should bottom out at around 22 megahertz. It's 22 megahertz down there. That's not so bad. And it should be totally zero at 21.25 because that's the audio. We don't want any audio bleeding through into the video. That's over there. It's definitely very low. Oops. 22 megahertz. I'm going to boost the gain up a little bit right there. See, by boosting that, it kills the overall response, so I don't think we want that. Let's Can I try it around there? I'll double check that 2575 again. That's about halfway. See if I can even up those lobes a little bit. It's tempting to do that, but now the gain isn't quite what it's supposed to be. Well, at some point you kind of say, eh, hey, it's, it's close enough. And I think that's what I'm going to call it right there. Alright, now for the audio. Now I'm checking the audio response of the ratio detector and I'm glad I did. I had a lot of trouble with this. I found numerous spots on the slug adjustment where it seemed to cross over zero and the response would go up and down as I passed that point. Well here's the response curve I've got and clearly it's wrong. It is supposed to look like that. Supposed to cross over zero at 21.25 and then go up on one side and down on the other. So let's see if we can rectify that. That doesn't seem to really be getting me what I want. So let's go the other way. Ah, that's what I'm talking about. That bit of noise, by the way, I determined that is from the cables. I think I'm picking up possibly the output of the horizontal oscillator or something like that. I have a good set of BNC cables, short BNC cables, but I can't find them. So the ones I'm using right now are a bit longer than I would like. I think I'm picking up a bit of noise, but I don't think it's really going to affect the alignment. It's a great thing about using markers. As long as your marker generator is really accurate and calibrated, the other stuff doesn't really matter so much. Because you're going to always know where you're at. I know I'm at 21.25 right there. And I know that that line is 
ground so I think we are pretty darn good alright let's see and hear how we did I also moved the focus coil around a bit while the set was turned off kinda got it more centered on there let's see if that makes any difference Focus does look a bit better. Still not perfect, but definitely better. Audio is not so hot, but I may need to tweak the channel fine tuning slug. Try a different channel. I say that because I played around with these channel tuning slugs before I aligned the audio, so they might be off a bit now. Picture's looking really good though. There's a little more height, I think. I went over the audio alignment, checked my work down below, everything seemed to be okay. Checked these tubes again and found the 6 SJ7 was weak, I replaced that. It seemed to get a little bit louder, but it was more like it just amplified the background noise a little more. I don't remember having trouble with these converter boxes before. So, in uh, fact, uh, particularly with early admirals. So I flipped this over to channel 6 and hooked up just a really crude long wire antenna. So as I said many times before, our channel 6 here is 87.7, which is really an FM radio station that has a weak video subcarrier that's NTSC. So you barely get any video, but crystal clear booming record. audio. I've read a couple different places that you, you look at this record. So, I think the problem is really with this converter box. So I'm going to try uh, some other sources. One, I'm going to get a test pattern generator out because I need it anyways to align it, and that has a tone generator. And we'll see if that comes through loud and clear, but I really think it is this box. I do have another type. Somebody asked me for recommendations. This is uh, an Access HD DTA-1010. I bought this like in 2009 when the government gave out coupons. I got a couple of these. Uh, recently somebody gave me another one that they were going to gonna toss. I don't know if they make these things anymore, but like from any brand, I mean, the, the conversion happened over a decade ago. Um, but one thing I, I have tried with these before is they do have component out. And I do have uh, an external RF modulator I can try using. Seems kind of silly, but <laughs> take this, take the baseband video and left channel, left and right audio, and then ignore the RF modulator in this and use an external RF modulator and feed it into this. So why would that be a problem? Why can't I get it with good sound with this? Because they may have fudged the audio subcarrier a little, a little bit, and it's not at exactly the right frequency it should be. Another option I've got is to use a blonder tongue uh, commercial modulator. My test pattern generator of choice these days is a Syncor VG91. Let's see how this set performs. Well, it's warming up. Uh, so this can do a bunch of stuff, but it uh, is really uh, geared for the newer 45 type IF stuff, so I can't use most of these functions. Ah, well, we seem to have some pretty good sound. Yeah. 
So I'm really, really thinking the problem is that converter box. And uh, like I said, I've had trouble before. I got a feeling that that probably doesn't work well with any set that uses a split carrier for the sound and video. Anyway, I'll uh, get the camera on the tripod and let's uh, tweak the picture. All right, so here's basic crosshatch pattern. A couple things right away. Uh, horizontal linearity is really, really good. Uh, vertical, it's a little bit scrunched at the bottom, stretched at the top. Uh, but otherwise, things are looking pretty good. Uh, there's a circle again. Horizontally looks good, vertically messed up a bit. Let's see if I can squeeze by the equipment here and get it to control on the back. So when the mirror starts to be handy because it's hard to see what you're doing. So there's two controls, height and linearity, and they definitely interact with one another. Kind of hard for me to see what I'm doing. I'm reaching around the back. It looks better to me, but it's up too high. I'll have to do that with the centering magnet on the back. Or not centering magnet, the uh, focus coil. I'm kind of just pushing in and out with my hands. So if I put this screw in more, it brings the picture down. Something like that, that will be correct. Cross hatch. Now you can't always get this perfect, and I can see it's kind of scrunched a little bit at the top, wider in the middle, scrunched a little bit at the bottom. Uh, sometimes you just gotta start try swapping the vertical output tube to get that to be any better. Color bars aren't gonna do us much good here. But this is the one I wanted to see. This gives us a pretty good idea of how good the alignment went. This is a multi-burst test pattern. So these correspond basically to bandwidth. That one I just turned off was a 2.5. So if you can see really distinct lines here, that means you got good video bang with up to 2.5 megahertz. This is three, three and a half, and four. Just kind of make out lines there. Only the super top of the line, perfectly set up TV is going to get out to 4.5. And once color came out, which to use the color burst at 3. Point, uh, 3.58 megahertz basically they had to sacrifice some of the video bandwidth to get, put the color information in so you never, and a set made after mid 50s or, or so, you're never going to get out here at all um, so anyways that uh, that is really good more color test patterns So I'll work on the centering. And I got the contrast and brightness up too high, that's why it's getting a little bit smeared. And remember this picture tube has got uh, some issues, so gotta factor that in a bit too. Here it is after a bit more twiddling around with the various controls, and I am happy with that. Turns out to get any focused uh, to get it to focus any better, the focus coil needs to go back, and it, I can't really go any further back. So the only thing I can do is alter the circuitry a little bit to either increase or decrease the coil flow, the current flowing through that coil. Otherwise, everything's working quite well. Audio sounding good. Crosshatch squares are a little bit taller in the middle than at the bottom or the top. I've had that same issue with other admirals with the same type of design. I think that's just the way it is. And again, here's that multi burst pattern. So 
So that's going to be it for this installment. We pick up next, I think I'll do some experimenting with the focus coil and uh, see if we can try some other method to get video in this to get cleaner sound and then start thinking about restoring the radio chassis.